The very first thing we have is the reading class Wednesday and Thursday. What is today? Friday? So that means we need to get Monday and Wednesday and Thursday. We've got lots of physics in the next week. Forces is what we're going to be talking about. A very basic concept in physics is any time you see an object accelerating. Now, there are two ways to accelerate. Can you tell me one of the two ways to accelerate anything? What does it mean if something is accelerating? Two things, one of two things are happening. Maybe both of them. Okay, something is accelerating. Its velocity is changing. It's getting faster. Or it's changing direction. If you ever see any object whose velocity is changing, which means speed and direction, whose speed changes or direction changes or both, you know a force is acting on it. And so that is the basic idea of what is a force. It causes Luke, yeah. acceleration. One of these students is pushing it, and the other is pulling it. Each student is exerting a force on the piano. A force has both magnitude and direction. It is measured in units of newtons. The student on the left is exerting a force of 25 newtons to the right. The student on the right is exerting a force of 20 newtons also to the right. What unit did they say force was measured in? <coughs> Newtons. You've heard of this guy, Isaac Newton. That's who it's named after. We will look a little bit later at the specific units that is involved. It's a kilogram meter per second squared. That's what a Newton is. A kilogram meter per second squared. So Thankfully, we have a new name. A net force on the piano. This net force is an unbalanced force on the piano and causes the piano to move to the right. An unbalanced force is always necessary to move an object from rest. What does the word net mean? Total. Total. The total. So if I have, just as an example, if I have somebody who was pulling to the right at 10 newtons, somebody who's pulling to the left at 8 newtons, what do you think the net force would be? 2 newtons to the... This way. <laughs> this way, my right. I guess it's your left, isn't it? So the net force is whatever the total or the leftover, the net. An unbalanced force is also necessary to change the motion of an object that is already moving. Balanced forces cause no change in the motion of an object, whether it is moving or at rest. So here in the tug of war, we won't name the classes that are there, but here in the tug of war, if the forces are equal and opposite, what is the net force? Zero. Zero. Which doesn't mean that there are no forces present. It simply means that they're totally balanced, equal and opposite. They're in equilibrium. There is no net force. So what is a force? Action exerted on an object which may change the object's state of rest or motion. They cause accelerations. Therefore, anytime I see an acceleration, I know there must be a force somewhere. And we measured them in Newtons. Forces can act through contact. You're most familiar with that. So when they pushes against Ben, that is a contact force. Or through distance. Can you tell me any type of force that may act where there is no contact? Electromagnetism, or let's just abbreviate that to magnetism. Magnetism. Two magnets don't have to touch each other to exert a force on each other, right? Another example. And it is true that the electrical force as well. Two separate forces. Can you think of another one that acts over a distance? That one. What did you say? Gravity. Now, a windmill is actually a contact force. Because the air particles itself, the wind itself, wind is made up of particles. So gravity, there's another one. So contact and field forces, I think I'm going to stop, skip that little one there. Oh, field forces are the ones that act over distance. I guess I better say that. So gravity, magnetism, electrical forces, those are all field forces. They act over a distance. Yes? Would heat be as well since it's like 
Now, heat, no, is the answer to that. I mean, that's good to try to think of these things. Heat, heat is a transfer of energy. Heat is a transfer of energy from two things that have a different, um, different energy level. And we'll study heat. So field forces like gravity or like magnetism do not require contact for that force to be felt. I want to ask you a question. How does gravity pull on you? I mean, if I reach out and grab Johnny's arm and start pulling, it's obvious that I am exerting a force and pulling in this direction. But when Johnny jumps up in the air right after he's dunked the basketball, how is gravity really pulling? What's pulling? What is bringing Johnny back down? There's an attraction. Anytime we have two masses, there's going to be a gravitational attraction. But what is actually in between there pulling? What is causing the attraction? Or what is acting that the attraction operates? Well, there is a force. Well, let me ask it a different way. Here's Johnny up in the air. How does the earth down here see Johnny? Johnny's not touching the earth. And reach up and grab Johnny and pull Johnny down. Now, I'm personifying the earth a little bit, taking a little personification. But I'm not sure I'm explaining my question real well. What is, maybe I should say, what is gravity? What is that force? Contact forces are easy to describe. Oh, my arm is pushing against the table there. I can see what's causing the force. But what's causing that force in between two masses? Johnny in the air and the earth down here, and Johnny starts being attracted back down to the earth. God. It's a God thing. Well, he did create it that way. What? We call it a gravitational field. But what is it? But what is it? Yes. And even atoms will have a gravitational force, but generally it's electrical force that's stronger with atoms. But what is, and I could have changed this to electrical, any field force, have you ever tried to analyze what is there that is causing the force? What is there in this empty space in between? <laughs> and I want it to break your brains a little bit because in some way it works. Laws of nature that I believe God created, but in some way it works. There's some mechanism. That's a better word. What's the mechanism that makes those two things come together? That makes gravity attract two things? Or if you're thinking about magnets, you have a south pole and a north pole. What's the mechanism that causes them to come together towards each other. Those are some of the interesting things in physics that we explore at the end of second semester. So the mechanism. Why, right? There are theories. There are theories of why. Yes, there are theories of why. And when we get down there, we are going. We're going to near the end of the book. We're going to discover that we study and this book and most physicists believes in what's called the particle view of nature. I have a little part, little poster under Einstein there. It says fundamental particles and interactions. I was just asking you a question about interactions. Gravity is an interaction between two objects. What's going on in there? Well, to give you a little clue, they believe there is this particle that they have named a graviton. You can probably figure out why they came up with the name. It kind of sounds like that. But they have named a graviton that is an intermediary that facilitates, that does the handshake so that two things are gravitationally attracted. So if you ever want to explore some really cool, expand your mind stuff, start reading about, and there's quantum physics that's going on. What's actually happening in between there? What's going on that the interaction can occur? So those are questions that we often have never even thought of. We've lived with gravity. We know it pulls us down. But what's the mechanism that's actually pulling us together? Have they actually found that particle, or is it just, is it just theorized? I think it is still theorized. Let me look at my charge. I think the graviton is still theorized. Yeah.
So how could they find it if they... Particle accelerators. That's one of the purpose of these particle accelerators. Now that graviton has tremendous energy. They believe their mathematical calculations with how we think the universe works says there should be this particle that acts this way. And so we're trying to find it. And it's highly energetic, which means you have to have tremendous amounts of energy in your particle collisions to have enough energy to hopefully sense it. Because you never can see these things, they're too small. You can see nothing that's shorter than a light wave. Nothing shorter than a light wave can be seen. And so how do we detect them? Well, we have to detect them other ways. Force diagrams. So we're talking about force. I got a little sidetracked there because it's kind of just interesting. Force diagrams. We need to make sure, since force is a vector quantity, that we show magnitude, size, and we show direction to it. So we're going to use vectors in order to do that. Just like with velocity and acceleration, we can use vectors. And so these vectors are these arrows. These vectors will draw force diagrams. Force diagrams are where we show all the forces acting in a situation. Let's take this left picture that is titled force diagram. We have a car driven by, we'll leave it nameless, because they ran into a brick wall. What are all the forces? Now notice, we will, I'm going to put a little dot right here, we will act like everything is at the center of this object, not try to draw them all in the position where they're actually contacting. What is this force, do you think? Gravity. That's gravity. That force is acting on the car. Gravity is acting on the car. So I'm going to call it F sub G, force due to gravity. What do you think this one is? That's the wall. That's the wall. That's the wall pushing on the car. That's the force of the wall. And let me come over here. This is on the wall. What do you think that force is? That's gravity again. Force of gravity. And what do you think this one is? That's the force of the car on the wall. So very good. I'm going to come back because I left one off. What is that? It's something that's acting against gravity, isn't it? Because it's going in the opposite direction. If we did not have this force right up here, it's all right, I want you to just think. If we did not have this force, I would have a net force, and think of vectors, I'd have a net force that would be something like that. Because the wall's pushing to the left, gravity is pushing down, which would mean my car would be moving in the direction of that red dash line. It would be accelerating in that direction. So there must be something that is pushing up that is keeping us from going down. I'm going to call it the force of the earth. Oh. If I am standing here, if you are sitting there, gravity is pulling us down. Something must be pushing up because we are in equilibrium. We have a net force of zero acting on us. We're sitting still. It's the force of the earth pushing back up on us. If that was not there, we would all be accelerating down through the earth, and that's obviously not happening. So there must be another force pushing back up. So there's the tie-in between force and acceleration. If I know I'm not accelerating, I'm just sitting motionless here, not accelerating, I know the net force acting on me must be zero. So I know I must have balanced forces. So what's this blue arrow coming up over here? Same thing, there's force. Now I'm going to change the letter because we actually call this the normal force. It is the force of the earth or the tabletop or whatever it is that's pushing back against gravity. We call it the normal force. And the word normal, that means B and F, the word normal means perpendicular in math or science. A normal is a perpendicular. So if I have a horizontal line, my normal to that horizontal line is a vertical line. It's simply a word that describes perpendicular. Yeah. What happens if you like have a hill? Is the Good question. If we have a hill, we're going to get to that, I think, today, or is it next time? It's going to be next time. So, but excellent question. We're going to have to wait on that one, though. 
force diagram shows all objects, all forces involved in an incident. A free body diagram is the one that we actually use to analyze what is happening on one object. I am really only interested in the car, let's say. So what are the forces acting on the car only? So without my car even drawn, so I have the force, which is still spelled with an L, force due to gravity, this was the force of the wall, this is the earth pushing back, that normal force that's going on. Really, if I do a free body diagram, I would not even draw the car. I would simply draw my force vectors. And a free body diagram is what allows us to then analyze what is going to happen to that object. Because we'll combine our vectors all together and we'll know what happens to that object. So, let's see, we have some everyday forces. A force is a push or a pull exerted on an object. Consider the situation shown here. To completely understand the motion of the toy, we will identify each force that acts on it. We begin by drawing a free body diagram. A free body diagram isolates the object in question and identifies each force that acts on that object. Let's draw a rectangle to represent the toy. We don't need to draw any of the items that touch or act on the body, such as the ramp or the rope. I will only do the dog, not the box. Identify and label each of the forces that act on the toy. First, consider gravity. The direction of this force is always straight down. We will label it F sub G. Now let's consider the contact force between the toy and the ramp. Contact forces always act in a direction perpendicular to the surface of contact. The word normal means perpendicular. Physicists refer to contact forces as normal forces in order to remind them of the direction that the forces act. Next, we think about the rope. Ropes cannot push. They can only pull along their length. The direction of the force on our free body diagram will be drawn accordingly. The final force we must consider is the force of friction. Friction always acts in the direction opposite the motion or potential motion. In this case, the toy is being pulled uphill. The motion is up the ramp, so the friction force is down the ramp. If we let go of the rope, the toy will slide downhill. Friction now points uphill. The final step is to add up all the forces. For this situation, the best choice would be to break each force into its components parallel and normal to the ramp. You can then find the net force on the object and therefore the change in motion in both directions. So let's talk about several of the things that she went through real fast. All the forces acting on are done right over here. Well, I know force of gravity and I always draw it how? Straight down, always. The normal force, did they catch? I thought it was until next time, but we get it today. Did, they, did you catch how we always draw the normal force? Perpendicular to the surface that we are on. It's always perpendicular to the surface. So if our ramp here is angled, the normal is perpendicular to that angle. The rope that they were pulling, well, we draw it in the direction it was going. Now, we never draw a force as a push. We always draw a force as a pull. So if I am pushing against this front wall up here, and I was trying to draw a free body diagram of the wall, I would draw a vector that starts at the wall and goes away from me. I wouldn't draw an arrow that's going into this dot, into the wall. Vector forces are always drawn as pulls away from that object. So even if you're pushing, draw it as a pull on the other side. Uh, next concept, friction. Which direction do I have to draw the vector representing friction? Opposite of the motion or potential motion. If I have a ramp and I have an object setting on that ramp, and even though we haven't talked about friction yet, you have an idea of what friction is. I have an object setting on this ramp and it's not going anywhere. The reason it's not going anywhere is there's friction between this object and my ramp. 
which direction would I draw, it's not moving, which direction would I draw the friction vector? Up, correct, because that's the way it, friction must be pulling because part of gravity is trying to make it go downhill. Very good. So friction is always opposite motion or potential motion. The next concept, if I'm going to combine vectors, the only way we can combine vectors is we can put all the horizontal ones together, we can put all the vertical ones together, but if I have one at an angle, I need to break it into its components. So I know it's horizontal and vertical component. Then I can go back and put all the horizontals together and all the verticals together. So that's what these little right triangle vector things that they are drawing in. I need to break it into its components. Now here is where it's not always necessarily exactly horizontal and vertical. Let's go with this ramp again. Let's say I have my ramp and I have my duct sitting on my ramp. Now my free body diagrams will not have boxes like they do. That's too much stuff. All I want is just a dot representing it. So I have my gravity that's going that way. I have the, what's this one called? Normal force, it's going that way. Now my duck is being pulled like this, so it's going like that. So if my duck is being pulled that way, which is my which direction is my friction? Opposite of the motion, and it would be like this, parallel to that ramp, because the motion of that duck would be straight up the ramp. Imagine that that's parallel. I have force of gravity, I have the force due to friction, I have my normal force, and I have the force of the pull, I'll call it. Is it if it's being pulled? By if it's being pulled, pulled up the ramp. If it was being pulled up the ramp. You're going to push it just the same way. Oh. If you were pushing it, yes. If I was pushing it like this, I'd draw it exactly the same way. Yeah. Don't ever draw an arrow going into the dot. They're always come away. They're always drawn as poles coming away. I don't want to use a horizontal and vertical axis system on this because it's really not oriented that way. It's oriented at this angle. So I would call this my x-axis and right here I would call my y-axis. So I am going to have an axis system that is parallel to the ramp, perpendicular to the ramp. Why? Well, because there always are a couple of forces that are going to be exactly along the x and y direction that way. And then the ones that are at an angle, I resolve. Remember, resolving means get their two components. So gravity, I would figure out how much is pulling this way and how much is pulling that way. There's a right angle right there. I am my y direction and my x direction. So I'd figure out what this angle is and I can get my two components. The same thing for the pull. Part of that pull is this way, that's the x direction for my new coordinate system, and part of the pull is that way, right angles, the y direction. And so I need to figure out what is that angle there, and I can resolve it into its components and then put them together. We'll practice doing that, but that's the concept. Since in that video clip they introduced it all, I figured I needed to explain it a little. Newton's first law. We are going to learn three laws of motion. Newton's three laws. You need to know the three laws. You need to know which one is the first law, which one's the second, which one's the third. Newton's first law. An object at rest remains at rest. The object in motion continues in motion with constant velocity unless the object experiences a net external force. Newton's first law is sometimes called the law of inertia. An object does not want to accelerate, which means change its motion. And it won't unless there is a net external force acting on it. So you sitting in your chair will remain sitting in your chair unless some force acts on it. A ball thrown, let's talk about in space, so that we're not going to have gravity acting on it or air resistance acting on it. A ball thrown in space is going to do what? Just keep going, straight line. It's going to maintain its motion. So the only time we change motion 
Another way of saying that is accelerate. The only time to accelerate is if there is a net external force acting on it. If the net force is zero, then it is not going to change its motion. So the vector sum of all forces would cancel or balance each other out or all be in equilibrium. So if we look back here at this car, we're not hitting a wall this time, so it is a good driver. This car is simply driving down the road at a constant velocity. That means if it's moving at a constant velocity, it's not accelerating. It's not changing its speed. It's not changing its direction. Constant velocity. That means the net force acting on the car is what? Constant. Point zero. Zero is zero. If it's not changing its velocity, which includes <coughs> speed and direction, it's moving constantly, its net force is zero. It doesn't mean there aren't any forces. There are forces acting on it. <coughs> but the net force is zero. It would mean that whatever gravity is pulling down, the normal force exactly balances it up. The engine is pulling or pushing that car forward, and the resistance, wind, tire, friction, whatever it is, is exactly balancing out whatever the engine is doing. The net force, net force equals zero. That should be a Greek letter there. That's sigma, capital sigma. Don't look too great in my picture there. Net force is zero. So all the forces are in equilibrium. So let's work. I was thinking one about next time. This is exciting. Let's work on one of these problems and actually see if we can not figure out the net force acting on. Derek leaves his physics book on the top of a drafting table that happens to be inclined to 35 degrees. The free body diagram below shows the forces acting on the book. Find the net force acting on the book. And if we can find the net force acting on the book, then I know exactly what is going to happen to that book. So here's how I would draw a free body diagram. Oh, I didn't want that. <laughs> here's my book, Adopt. So I have gravity pulling down, force due to gravity, and they even told me it happened to be 22 newtons. 22 newtons. I have the normal force here, we're being perpendicular to the surface, the table is pushing back on the book, so that normal force happens to be 18 newtons. I have something working right up the table, I guess they tell me, it's the force of friction, which is 11 newtons. Now that is telling me either the book is sliding down the table, or maybe that friction is strong enough to hold the book in place. Potentially it can go down the table, that's why friction is going backwards. So I'm going to find the net force on this. Well, I know that these two things are already perpendicular to each other. Friction is along the surface and the normal is perpendicular. So that's going to be my coordinate system. This is going to be my x-axis. This is going to be my y-axis. And I need to resolve my gravity. Part of gravity is pulling directly into the table. And right angles to that, part of gravity is pulling down the table, the two components of that gravity. So I need to figure out my angle that is going on right here. So here is an illustration so we know what that angle is going to be. They told me that that table was tilted at 35 degrees, right? So if I start off with my horizontal table and a normal, something perpendicular to it right over here, now I'm going to keep my hand pointing down, directly down, and I'm going to elevate that table 35 degrees. How far away from my hand did that normal move? Johnny? 35 degrees. It moved exactly the same. My hand was perpendicular to the surface. My hand remains vertical, and as this tilts 35 degrees, the ramp tilts 35 degrees, that normal tilted 35 degrees from the vertical. So it's real nice when they tell me, oh, your ramp is tilted 35 degrees. I know that angle is going to be 35 degrees. Gravity stays straight down. 
and my perpendicular is tilted 35 degrees just like the horizontal is tilted 35 degrees. So help me out. I want to know the force of gravity in the y direction, because I'm called <laughs> x direction, because I'm now calling this my x direction. How would I find that? Sine of 35. There you go. I'm going to say 22 times the sine of 35. Go ahead and do it on your calculator. And we have two significant figures. So what is it? 13. 13 newtons. I want to know the force of gravity in the y direction. And how will I find that one? That one involving 22 cosine. Cosine of 35. What did you get? 18 newtons. 18 newtons. Good question. My vector tells me the direction. But I can think of this as a negative 18, and this one as a positive 18. If you add the negative 18 and the positive 18 together, what do you get? Zero. Or you can think of, I've got 18 with this normal vector and 18 with this component vector, and I am in equilibrium in the y direction. Now that makes me feel real good, because if I wasn't in equilibrium in the y direction, that book would either be levitating like this, <laughs> or it would be sinking down through that ramp. <laughs> now how about my x direction? This is, and this is, what's happening to the book? It's sliding down with a net force of what? I have a net force of two newtons down the ramp. I'll just say down ramp. I made up which direction the x and y, but that's how I'm going to do it, and that's how your book is going to do it. I've got a net force of two newtons, therefore I know that thing's accelerating down the ramp. That thing that looks like summation notation is net. Net. Correct. It looks like summation notation. That means net. Yeah. Sum, I'm adding up everything. That's what net is. I'm adding up all the vectors. It is a sum. Okay. But yes, that means net. I guess we should go tell Mr. Tins that his book's falling. That what? Mr. Tins that his book's falling. Oh, inertia. The tendency of an object to resist being moved. If the object is moving, to resist a change in speed or direction. I mentioned that Newton's first law and let me state Newton's first law again. An object in motion remains in motion or stays in motion, or an object at rest stays at rest unless a net external force acts on it. Newton's first law. Also called the law of inertia, because inertia is an object's resistance to change in motion. So Newton's first law is called the laws of inertia. Mass is a measure of inertia. I forgot a couple of illustrations that I'm going to get before this class is over so I can show you those illustrations. Mass is a measure of inertia. The more mass something has, the harder it is to change its state of motion. Do you agree with that idea? Yes. Yeah. So if you have somebody who weighs 300 pounds running down the football field, that's going to be harder to change that object's motion <laughs> than somebody who weighs 50 pounds running down the football field. So I think it's pretty obvious that the more mass we have, the more inertia we have. And inertia is a measure of how difficult it is to change motion. Equilibrium, the state in which the net force is zero. We're in equilibrium when we have no acceleration going on, no change in motion, does that mean I'm not moving? No, there's just no acceleration. No, just no acceleration. So I can be in equilibrium and be moving just like this, if I'm really, really steady. Like in space. A straight line, constant velocity, net force is zero. I'm in equilibrium. As soon as I start turning, I'm no longer in equilibrium, and I know there must be a force acting on that. So an object can either be at rest or moving at constant velocity. Both of those are in equilibrium, where the net force is zero. 
So Newton's first law is describing objects that are in equilibrium. <coughs> Question. If, um, if, like, for instance, a skydiver is falling, and I mean, obviously yeah. this would be theoretical because you can't you can't reach absolutely perfect velocity. But what if he reaches terminal velocity and is moving as fast as he can go and stays at that speed? Would that be? This is per that's a perfect example for what's going on here. Here's a force, a free body diagram on the skydiver. That skydiver has what acting on them? Gravity. Has the force of gravity. It also has something else acting. Yeah. It has the force of, I'm going to call it resistance, air resistance. Now the faster, now gravity will accelerate that skydiver. Because when that skydiver jumps out of the plane, they're not in equilibrium. Gravity is a stronger force than the resistance, the wind resistance back against you. Because when you first jump out, you're not moving very fast down. When you stick your hand out of the car and you're moving at five miles an hour, there's not much air resistance, right? But the faster you go, the greater the air resistance becomes. So that's what's happening here. As gravity accelerates us downward, that resistance is going to get more and more and more until at some point, these two things, here's a geometry, will equal each other. Where the force of resistance will be exactly the same as the force of gravity. And at that point, my net force is zero, I'm in equilibrium, and my velocity is constant. Terminal velocity. I have reached the speed I'm going to go, and I will not go any faster. Unless you suck all the air away, and then you've gotten rid of the resistance, and you'll keep accelerating faster, faster, faster. But that doesn't happen. Skydiver, you know, the skydiver, they go out like this, and they're diving down. Terminal velocity, anybody know? Miles an hour, what terminal velocity is on average? This is, this is not a physics measurement, obviously. 120 miles an hour. For a human skydiver, um, 120 miles an hour. Now, it's different if you make yourself straight like a pencil and start diving down straight with either your feet or your head, you can go faster than that. But 120 miles an hour. Don't hit the ground at 120 miles an hour. Because the fall doesn't kill you. You all know that. The problem is when you stop real fast. All right. An agriculture student is designing a support system to keep a tree upright. Two wires have been attached to the tree. They're placed at right angles to each other, parallel to the ground. Here's the tree. So there's a wire going this way, a wire going that way. Right angles to each other, parallel to the ground. That's what they're saying. One wire exerts a force of 300 newtons. So here we go. This is the top of the tree. We're a bird looking straight down. So one wire exerts a force of 30 newtons. So there we go, 30 newtons. I'm guessing attached to like another thing. Yeah, obviously, I don't know what. And the other is 40 newtons. So here's one right angle to it. Remember this is a bird's eye view, we're looking straight down. There's 40 newtons. Now it's really 30.0 and 40.0, so we have three significant figures. Determine where to place a third wire and how much force it should exert so that the net force on the tree is zero. I didn't get that straight there. But there we go. All right, well, in general, we have an idea that it's probably back like this. Well, all I need to do is combine these two vectors together. Now, if I want to combine vectors together, I put them end to end. So I can slide this over here. It's going to be the same net result. My 40 newtons is just over here, and I need to get the result of this. Oh, well, this is easy. That's 40. That's 30. You don't need a calculator. What is it? 50. 3, 4, 5. It's a 3, 4, 5 triangle. So this one is 50 newtons. Now, I also need to know an angle. How am I going to get that angle? Let's take our arc tangent or inverse tangent of. Exactly I, I was doing that actually. Like, if you do 3, 4, it doesn't come out to be exactly 60 degrees. No. 
No, a three four five is not a thirty six nine term. They're two different terminals. They're both special, but they're two different ones. What do you get? How many degrees? Inverse tangent of four thirds. Wait, how did you get to use tangent? Okay. And I actually have three significant figures. Because the two when you have values that you know, you use the values that you know, so it's opposite Correct. Opposite over adjacent. Those are my original numbers that I know. So we go back to our original not some rounded number, which in this case it's exact, but we use the original. Now, if I'm going to describe how much force should be exerted and I want to know where, determine where, and determine how much, well, equilibrium needs to be exactly opposite this one. So, this is 53.1. What is that angle up there? We'll, well call 80, it alpha. 180 minus 53.1. 180 minus 53.1. What do you get? Well, <coughs> okay. And uh, 126.9 because we're subtracting and we know exactly to the tenth on this one. So we know tenth when we subtract there. So I would know that I need to exert, exert a force of 50.0 newtons at 126.9 degrees. Ooh, what should I say? <laughs> Above. It'd be good to have a diagram. The 30 newton force. In some way I have to explain. I don't know, because this one's not in the book. <laughs> So you would want a diagram. It's going to be exactly 180 degrees or opposite of what the net force is acting on it. That will put it at equilibrium. So this one wire right here will balance it all out. Could you put that opposite of the net force acting on it? Yes, if you described to me that the net force was 53.1 degrees. Well, yeah, like yes, but correct. Yeah, if you describe the net force and then say the equilibrium will be exactly opposite or 180 degrees from. Okay. Should uh, 126.9 be 127? That's what I was thinking right at first. But remember when we add and subtract 53.1? That 180 is exact, I mean, as far as I need it. And if I subtract 53.1, adding and subtracting, you go to the, to the decimal place. It's not counting. We almost always count significant figures because we almost always are multiplying and dividing. But if I'm only adding or subtracting, you actually go to the smallest unit place. And I'm at the tenth. So this is at the tenth. Josh. So you have said like um, 126.9 like from the 30. Yeah. Yeah. I could have said it that way too. All right. Why don't you look on your syllabus and start working because I have a couple of illustrations that I want to show you. So do that while I go collect the illustration stuff.